Lord, thank you very much for the opportunity to be rebuked by your word, to be edified by your word, to see you, Lord Jesus, in your word. I pray that we would hear your words, Christ, and that we would humbly submit to them, would search our hearts for how we can be as forgiving as you are. So thank you for the example that you set. Please help us now to worship you in this hour. It's been a, a, a longer day, Lord, and we need help to be able to pay attention to your word and to apply your word. So please help us now to worship you with humble, pure hearts. Amen. Anita Epstein wrote an article for the, the Jewish Daily Forward. And the article is entitled, Why I Cannot Forgive Germany. And she starts her article with a quote from another lady named Ellie Weisel. And the quote is, I cannot and I do not want to forgive the killers of children. I ask God not to forgive. She begins her article, It was more than 15 years ago, but I still remember the date clearly. My husband and I hosted a dinner in, at our home for emerging young German leaders. They are participating in an exchange program with the American Jewish Committee that included a week in Washington, D.C. I viewed the evening as a test of how I would deal with Germans, indeed of whether I could deal with them at all. The Germans, after all, had murdered most all of my family in the Holocaust. To say nothing of their wanton slaughter of millions of other Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and others. I escaped that gruesome fate myself only because shortly after my birth in the ghetto in November 1942, my parents gave me away to be hidden by a Polish Catholic family. More than a million Jewish children, however, were not so fortunate. They were strangled or starved, shot or gassed, bashed against walls or tossed out windows, burnt in ovens or buried in mass graves. I tried to behave myself that evening, I really did, but I could not help myself. I asked a wispy young German woman who, with whom I was speaking whether she thought she was capable of throwing a baby off a balcony. She was stunned. What do you mean? I told her that Germans routinely had thrown Jewish children off balconies during the Holocaust. Did she think that she could have done something like that? She protested. She said that she was not even alive during the Holocaust. How could I think such a thing? Wouldn't I ever be able to forgive the Germans? She began to cry. I told her that it was not hard for me to think of such things. I think about such things often. I think about how easily I could have been one of the murdered babies. I think of how the Germans killed all the pregnant Jewish women they discovered in the ghetto, along with so many others. I think of how my mother avoided their clutches to bring me into this world after she suffered terribly in four Nazi camps and returned from the brink of death, found me again after the war. And I think of the father, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, and others I will never know of the post-war anti-Semitism in Germany and Poland and the resentment heaped on me by some Holocaust survivors whose sons and, and daughters have, um, had perished. When I was older, I realized that I was a constant reminder to them of the inability, uh, their inability to save their own children. She goes on to explain how she began to live a life that was a successful life. And she says that none of this, um, however, has been thanks to the Germans, who are responsible only for the darkest corners of my life, including, among other things, my regular nightmares, my survivor guilt. Why was I spared? And my persistent fear of intruders and attackers. No, I cannot forgive the Germans. That's God's job. She says, no, I cannot forgive the Germans. That's God's job. At the end of the article, she explains that on Judgment Day, that she would like to have a word with God when he judges the Germans. Meaning that she would um, persuade him not to forgive them. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. What's the easy answer to that story? There isn't one. Uh, what are you supposed to say to uh, Anita? Are you supposed to say something trite? 
like most um, easy believism, oh, just forgive. Forget about it. Move on. What about all those um, murders? How is she to respond? Is she right to have that anger? Is she right to live that way? Is she right to speak to that, um, that young German lady the way she did? No, she's not. She's not. She doesn't understand biblical forgiveness. She doesn't have the power to forgive. Because she herself has not been forgiven and she herself has not seen her own sin before God. When someone does that, when God saves that way, then you can even forgive a Nazi. What does the Lord have to say about forgiveness? Before we get into the text, think a few thi- let's think a, a little systematic theology about forgiveness to help you. Okay? So, let's think about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. What forgiveness is. Forgiveness is a promise not to remember anymore. It's a promise not to remember anymore. You, you've been hurt by someone, and when they repent, you agree with them that you will not bring it up to yourself, you will not bring it up to God, you will not bring it up to them. It's a promise that I'm not going to remember it anymore. Repentance, biblically, is conditional. In Luke 17, verses 1 to 10, we see how the Lord explains that when someone repents is when you forgive them. In Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, we see that we forgive the way God does, and God forgives repentant people. So repentance is the condition for forgiveness. But we also see in the Scripture that we're always ready to forgive and praying for it, ready in your heart to forgive. No grudges, no bitterness, no anger. You can see that in the way the Lord is crucified. When he he has a prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You can see it in, in, that's in Luke 23, 34. You can see in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, the way that Stephen has a similar prayer where he prays to the Lord that the Lord would forgive them. And the Lord answered those prayers. Many of the crucifiers were converted and forgiven. In Acts 2. The Lord answered Stephen's prayer. One of the men who, who, whom they had, the, the men who were throwing the rocks laid their coat at the feet of who? At Saul. And the Lord heard Stephen's prayer to forgive. It's important to understand that those are prayers of forgiveness and they're not, uh, it's not forgiveness granted because the people were not repenting at that time. Forgiveness is, has the goal of reconciliation. If you don't understand that and keep that in focus, that the goal of, re- of forgiveness is to reconcile two parties, then misunderstandings of forgiveness will arise if you don't understand it. When people say, oh, I forgive you, but I don't want anything to do with you. You see how that's not forgiveness? Because it misses the whole goal of forgiveness, which is reconciliation. Biblical forgiveness can be categorized in two different ways. There's forgiveness when God forgives you as judge and when he forgives you as father. He forgives you as judge like the, the man in the temple who's praying, God, be merciful to me, be propitiatory towards me, the sinner. He's asking for forgiveness, for his sins to be wiped away. And that's a once and for all time act. But then you see how the Lord teaches Christians in the, in the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer, that you're to pray, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's something that, it's, it's similar to the way when Peter was, um, had his feet washed by the Lord. You remember how he says, Lord, um, not my feet only, but my hands, uh, my head, my whole body. And he, the Lord explains to him, uh, you're clean. But not all of you, you need your feet washed. And he's explaining this, two different types of forgiveness. 
What biblical forgiveness is, is something that whether you're offended or you're the offender, you must act. If you have been offended, Luke 17 calls you and commands you to go to your brother and rebuke him and forgive him if he repents. If you have been offended, Matthew 5, 23 to 26, commands you to go to the one. If, you, if your brother has something against you, something you've done to him, you need to go to him and plead for forgiveness. Think through now what forgiveness is not. These things will help you understand the text better when we get into it. Forgiveness is not apologizing. A lot of families, when something bad happens, somebody in the family will come up and they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry that I screamed at you that way. What are you supposed to do with, I'm, I'm sorry? They kind of reply, well, I'm sorry it happened too. So now we're kind of at a stalemate, okay? That's great. They were both sorry. Now what happens? You see how that kind of apologizing is not asking for forgiveness. There's, there's a difference there. When asking for forgiveness, you have to admit your sin. You have to a- admit that you're indebted to the person you've sinned against and that you don't deserve this. So forgiveness is not apologizing. Forgiveness is not forgiving yourself. And all the Lord's people said, mm-hmm, amen. <laughs> and forgiving yourself is when you begin to think of forgiveness as simply good feelings. The idea of forgiveness is so that you feel better. You get your conscience clean. So you've sinned against somebody else, and then you think, through, how can I feel better about it? I will forgive myself. Yes, Mark, I forgive me. And suddenly I feel better. It's like a facade of cleanness when it's, n- it's no forgiveness at all. It's something that psychology has developed in order to try and make people feel better while they stay in their sin. So forgiveness is not about forgiving yourself. It's not about you feeling better. When you get forgiven, you'll feel better. Believe me, but that's not what it's about. And if that's what you make it about, then you're going to twist the theology of forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is not simply forgetting. You'll hear that common phrase, forgive and forget. That's a, that's a, a misnomer. There's a, if I try and not think about you know, papers, right? And I try not to think about papers, not to think about papers, not to think about papers. What am I thinking about? Papers. If I try not to think about the sin, not to think about the sin, not to think about the sin, it's just going to make me think about the sin more. So it's real forgiveness is when you choose, I will choose not to remember, and I'm going to move my mind to something else. I'm not going to remember their sin anymore. So it's a choosing not to remember. And when it does come up in your mind, you're saying, I'm choosing not to remember. You can see from this, forgiveness is not simply an emotional thing, but is much more a choice of the will. You see that? How you make the decision? Forgiveness is not necessarily trust. You can forgive the one who abuses your family, But it's something else to bring them and invite them into your home to to live with you. So trust is something that that comes through time. But forgiveness is something that God commands when someone repents. Forgiveness is not the absence of serious consequences. What happens to David when he sins against Bathsheba? the, The Lord does not remember his sin what Nathan says to him. But what are the consequences? Yes, the baby dies, and he has a whole life. Read the rest of 2 Samuel. The rest of 2 Samuel is a battlefield, literal and figurative, of the effects of David's sin with Bathsheba. You can see this in when the, the teenager, when he, he takes dad's car, and he goes out, he has a wreck with it. And then he goes to his dad, and he says, Dad, 
please forgive me. He says, I forgive you, son. Now, son, you're going to pay for the car. He says, what? I thought you forgave me. You see how forgiveness must have consequences? He's got to pay for the car. Forgiveness does not take away the consequences. But what it does do is reconcile. Forgiveness is about reconciliation. The greatest reconciliation is between a sinful person and a holy God. So to understand how to be reconciled to your brother, you've got to understand how you're reconciled to God. And then that will help you live out forgiveness. The Lord has a lot to say about forgiveness. And perhaps what's most memorable is this parable in Matthew 18. Let's look at it. Understand that the, there's going to be five parts. Verses 21 to 22 is the setup, the intro. Verses 23 to 27 are about God's compassionate forgiveness. And it's scene one of the parable. Scene two, in verses 28 to 30, we have the unforgiving Christian. In verses 31 to 34, so we have scene three of the parable. And it's God's judgment on the unforgiving. In verse 35, we have the conclusion. I love the parables where the Lord has those intros and conclusions because they really help you understand why he's telling the story, who he's telling it to, and then he applies it to us at the end. So understanding the context in Matthew 18. We're in Peter's house. Likely Peter's house. He's in the, the house is what Mark, the, the Gospel of Mark says. So it's likely the house where they regularly stay. And while they're there at the house, Jesus picks up a, a young child while the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. And he begins to make an illustration to them about salvation and what it is to be humbled and how true salvation is a, is a mighty humbling. And that you must become like this little child if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on from there to explain how Christians are to live. In verses 6 to 10, he, he warns about the one who takes a little child, and the little child is the, the imagery throughout the chapter. Who takes, who, he warns about the person who comes and perverts the, the walk of the little child. The person who comes and who's a millstone. Someone who drags some, one of these little children off away from the, the path of righteousness. In verses 12 to 14, he talks about the importance of going after one of those little ones who's gone away like a sheep. And then in verses 15 to 20, he begins to apply, what if I go after the sheep and little Flossie bites me and, and attack, it doesn't want to come back? What if the brother sins against me? What do we do then? And then he outlines a four-step process. Or five-step, if, if the, the person will examine themselves. And then naturally in the context, and it's still in the same place, Peter has a question. And it's about this forgiveness, since we're already on the topic. In verse 21, Then Peter came to him. And aren't you glad Peter comes? He asks a lot of questions, and it's so helpful to us. People who ask questions are bold enough to help the rest of the body when everyone else is quiet. But Peter, Peter is one of those people who understands by asking questions. I remember going to school with people like that. They always say, one more question, one more question, one more question. We called one guy, one more question. That was just like his nickname. But it helps everyone else to understand, and that's what Peter does here. And he asks an interesting question. He says, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You can see him, smi almost see him smiling, right? He has in his, in his heart, you've been teaching about how to forgive, and I'm ready to forgive. And I am so ready to forgive. He has gone above and beyond what was taught during the day. It was a common teaching to take Amos, chapter 1, verses 3 to 10, and say you forgive a man three times. 
And Peter says, look at how the Lord's teaching about forgiveness. I'm going to take the common teaching and I'm going to double it. But more than that, one more than that. I'm going to, I'm going to be even more better than double. And he says, Lord, how often shall, shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him to seven times. Now, the, the way that the, this is phrased in Greek is called a deliberate subjunctive. So what that means is you're saying something and you already believe it and you're just getting the person to come along with you. So it's as if Peter is saying, seven times, right, Lord? Seven times. And he says it in a, in a, in a direct address. He says it in the, in the vocative, right? He says to him directly, Lord, you think, don't you, Lord, that seven times is a good, is a good number? And the Lord responds in verse 22, strongly contrasting. In the Greek, the first word is no. He says, no, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, what is the sin in what Peter says? Why does he get rebuked by the Lord? He puts a qualification, a number, on forgiveness. The sin is in, in verse 21 is up to seven times. He's saying, where's the limit? And the Lord is saying, no, there is no limit. So the Lord says to him, no, I do not say to you up to seven times. See, he's, re he's repeating up to. He's taking Peter's words, and he does this in a beautiful way. Where he, where he takes his words and says, up, no, not up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. If you have an ESV, it may say 77 times. And that, that may be a more accurate rendering. But the point is not to say, okay, I got my list here, and ah, yes. Finally, you hit 78. <laughs> I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> now I don't have to forgive you. Obviously, Jesus is speaking in hyperbole. He's saying, no, 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 it's not countable. It's not 491. It's not 78. No, no, you, you have an unlimited amount of times you are to forgive your brother. You don't keep count. And then he begins in the parable. And you understand this parable is meant to correct Peter. So now we see the first scene of the parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is the, the marker of the, when Jesus is going to begin his parable. And he loves it. Matthew loves to have this phrase. And he has it particularly in chapter 13, chapter 20. And he continues it throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of King Jesus. It's present here and now, and it is to come. It's present here and now by those who Christ rules over. And it is to come when he will one day, his rule will come earthly, and hit, when his feet hit the Mount of Olives. So in verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like, this is what it's like to be under the rule and reign of Christ, like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now this, this certain king, he has, this is a, obviously a financial term here with settle accounts. He's beginning to maybe, maybe taxes that he's settling with his slaves. But he's beginning, he's, he says, get the books out. We're going to see who owes me money, how much they, money they owe me, and we're going to go to them. It's payment time. In verse 24, And when he had begun to settle counts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now you, you notice that this man didn't come to him on his own, but it, he was brought. It's, it, he was brought to him, and he owed him 10,000 talents. Now talent is, not, is a weight. It's not necessarily a monetary amount. So if it's gold... We're talking about a serious amount of money. If, we're, if, it's, if it's silver, talents of silver, we're still talking about a serious amount of money. A, 
if you look on the back of the MacArthur Study Bible, there's a chart where it takes talents and denarii. If this is silver, then it's, if I remember right, it's $3.7 billion in today's money, according to the chart in the back of the Bible. The amount here, 10,000, is the largest written number in Greek. So it may not be a number at all. It may just be a way of saying zillions. The man came up, was brought before the king, and he owed him zillions. It's an, it's, this number is used to describe the, the host around the throne who are worshiping the Lord in Revelation. Myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands. And it's expressing a number you can't count. And it's the same with our term when we say zillions. He owes him zillions. So this man owes the king a number that he will never, ever be able to even see, let alone pay. So verse 25, but he was not able to pay. Yeah, that's right, no doubt. His, commander, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and the payment be made. This is justice. This is justice. This is not an uncommon thing in the day. That the king is like, well, since he's stolen this, all this money, then what needs to happen is justice. At least we'll get money from, what he, from him being sold into slavery. And his wife and his children and all that he has. In the day, a wife and children were considered property of the, of the, the head of the home. So that's why they must be sold too. You can see the ache and effect of his sin. So the servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. You see the desperation? He's got no hope. He can't plead. That's not just. That's not fair. No, all he can plead for is patience, mercy, compassion. And he wants to say, I'll do the right thing. I'll pay you all. He can't pay it all. He's scrambling. He's, he's, he feels the people dragging him off and his family off to the dungeon. And then the master does something amazing. The master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Think about this first scene in verses 23 to 27. And we, un- we can see God's compassion, God's compassionate forgiveness. In Psalm 145, verse 8, we hear about how the Lord is full of graciousness and compassion. And when you hear about the story about that king, you say, wow, that is like the Lord. In Psalm 86, verses 5 and 15, 15 we see how he's ready to forgive. In Psalm 130, verses 3 to 4, we see, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? Who could stand? And you see this story, the the salvation of the Lord. In Ezra 9, 6, he does a prayer where he says, I am too ashamed. Our iniquities have gone over our heads. In this parable, you see how the, the master is coming to judge. And God the Father is coming to judge every, everyone who does not have Christ to pay for their sins. This, this judge is coming to settle accounts. And one day our Lord will settle accounts with every person on the planet. In verse 24, you see that your debt of sin is greater than you can count. Do you get the point? The talents and the numbers about the 3.7 billion... That is your sin. You're to think of your life before God as that amount of sin. Just think if you were to to have an ungrateful attitude, maybe an unloving word, maybe just two sins for each hour, and you're awake 16 hours, if you add it up, If you were to live 75 years, having two sins an hour, 
you would have over 21 million sins against God. Think about it. In reality, you have sinned much more than two times an hour. You have more than, than millions, you have more than 21 million sins against a holy God. You have more sins than you can count. And we're talking about um, someone who grows up in the church, someone who grows up in the world, it doesn't matter. You have millions and millions. You have a debt that you will never be able to pay on your own. And you could say some foolish thought like, oh Lord, I will pay it all. And he would just shake his head. You have no idea of the debt. What if justice were demanded for your crimes? What if justice came for you and the millions upon millions upon millions of your own sins? You would never be able to pay. But what compassion does God have? That when the master looks and he has compassion, this word is the same when the good Samaritan sees the man in the street. The same term is described. When the good Samaritan looks at the man in the street and has compassion on him, that's what the, this, this master has when he sees his slave before him on his face. He has compassion. The same word described in Luke 15, when the father has compassion on the son. And this is describing the compassion and the mercy of God the Father. Did, did this judge, did he have to forgive? It was out of the kindness of his heart. There was nothing, nothing persuading him, begging him that no reason why he had to do it. He did it out of the goodness of his heart. And at what cost to him? It cost this master a great amount. What character does he have? He didn't just reduce the payment and say, work it off. He paid it all. And when you see that story, you think, and, uh, and Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He washes away your crimson stain and washes you white as snow. Think through now. Specifically, remember the ways that you've sinned. Just don't think the amount. Think specifically how you rejected his word. And how this slave would have known the day was coming. He would have known with this incalculable amount of money. This is going to really cost me someday. Hopefully I won't get caught. This will really cost me someday. And how you did the same. When you heard the word of God, you did not repent. You did not listen. You said, oh, it's okay. I'll get by. I can disobey. I can live this way. You rejected the will of the king of kings. You blasphemed against him with his thoughts, thinking he will, judgment will not come for me. I can continue on in this, this blasphemy against him. Think of how your rebellious example. With this slave, when others saw him, and how this amount of money, incalculable, what kind of example was he setting for the other slaves? It's hard to hide that kind of money. But think about you. You did the same. In your rebellion, you set an example for others to defy the living God. You need this compassion and this forgiveness. And if you understand this compassion and forgiveness, then you can go on to forgive your brother. Because in Luke 7, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. Only this person who understands their sin to this degree, who understands the compassion of God to this 
degree of amazement only that person can forgive. Do you see your sin in that way? Do you see your God in that way? Scene number two. Verses 28 to 30. We see scene number two, the unforgiving slave. C.H. Spurgeon said, How hard a heart could this be that such a fire of love did not soften it? How hard a heart this could be that such a fire of love could not soften it. Verse 28, But that servant went out, found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience on me, and I will pay you all. Does this sound familiar? That's a quote taken from verse 26. Master, verse 26, Master, have patience with me, with me and I will pay you all. Verse 29, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And as he's choking his fellow slave, you understand, he came to his master. He came to someone he had stolen against, an incalculable amount. And he pled for mercy. But this man is not his master. He's not a master over him. He's a fellow slave. And it's not an incalculable amount. This, a denarii is the common day, day's wage. If you were to take the same chart and look out a denarii, it comes to, with 100 denarii, it comes to about today's equivalent of $3,200. So he owed $3.7 billion, and this man comes and hurts him with $3,200. You see a problem there? And look at verse 30. It parallels verse 27. And he would not, but went through him into prison till he should pay. Verse 27. The master had compassion. Three things. Compassion, released him, forgave him. Verse 30. Three things. Threw him into prison. Oh, he went, threw him into prison, and that he should pay the debt. Complete opposite. Instead of compassion, he has bitterness, anger. Instead of releasing him, he throws him in prison. Instead of forgiving him, he holds him to the debt. It's supposed to remind you of the, of the story. It's supposed to be paralleled right next to each other. Because when you go to your brother and you will not forgive your brother, it is exactly parallel. You have become the hypocrite. Think through the excuses that come in your mind when you don't want to forgive. What are the excuses that come when you want to be like this guy? This guy says, I can't forgive my fellow slave. People will see me as weak. And people will see me as weak and they will do the same sin against me. Justice. Justice must be done. But I say to the unforgiving one, is the Lord weak? No. And how compassionate and forgiving is he? The man with bitterness will say, but people will continually sin against me if that happens. Not only will other people come, but when they sin, the people who do sin, they'll sin continually. But I say to that man with bitterness, when the Lord forgives someone, does he not give them a new heart and a new for, in order to no longer continue in that sin? When they see the compassion, the forgiveness of the Lord? The man with bitterness will say, but I knew a holy man, I knew a righteous person who, did, who would not forgive. And I say to that man with bitterness, he was no holy man at all. He was not a spiritual giant at all. If he could not forgive... He was not the leader that you thought him to be. The man of bitterness says, he wouldn't forgive me if the table was turned. And I say to the man of bitterness, 
But the, you would not have forgiven the Lord if the table was turned. The man with bitterness says, I would, but he doesn't deserve it. And I say to the man with bitterness, you don't deserve it either. And the Lord forgave you. The man of bitterness says, I would, but I cannot forget. It is not in my ability. And I would say to the man of bitterness, what a sad confession this is. If you cannot forgive, how can you be a Christian? The man of bitterness will say, but they accused me falsely. And, we say to them, and I say to the bitter man, but the Lord was accused falsely. The bitter man says, I'll do it when I feel like it. Come back at another time when I feel more generous. And I say, the Bible says to you and commands you to repent, not when you feel it. The bitter man says, when he comes to me, I'll be willing to forgive. No, the Bible says in Luke 17 that you must go to him and rebuke him, and if he repents, you forgive him. The bitter man will say, when I get more faith, I'll have forgiveness like that. And I say to the bitter man, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could forgive the greatest sinner. It's when you have real faith, then you're able to forgive. The bitter man says, when I see fruit, then I will forgive him. And I say, yes, there must be fruit of repentance. But are you ready and willing to forgive? Are you praying? Lord, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Do those ex excuses come in your mind when someone has hurt you? The Bible answers them all. The Bible answers them all. Unforgiveness, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, opens the door to Satan. You're going to give Satan an open door if you do not forgive. Let's see the final scene of this parable, verses 31 to 34. The scene of God's judgment on the unforgiving. Verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw that what, he had been, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And this is going to happen. Other Christians will see your bitterness and they're going to be very grieved by it. They're going to come to you and speak to you. And if you don't hear them, then they will go to the Lord and pray. And they will go through the steps that are outlined in the verses prior to this passage. And when it comes up, they bring they tell the master, in verse 32, that his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? Do you see the disgust that he has? How could you do this? Think about what it looks like for you not to forgive. Uh, you, can, you can learn about this in uh, the bitterness book out in, in the hallway. Some of these things. When you don't forgive, it's going to look like you spend a lot of time thinking about trivial disappointments. Oh, if I had only been with that girl. Oh, if I had only gotten that car. Only if I had only gotten that job. If you are unforgiving, bitterness in your heart, you'll have difficulty resolving conflicts. Do you try and get along with somebody and then somebody else has to sort it out for you? You're not obeying this passage. Do you withdraw from people and say, fine, I'm going to take my toys and go home. And I won't talk to you anymore. You see how you like it? They won't, you won't even know it until you want to talk to me. 
And then you'll find out you're not, for, you're not forgiving. You have outbursts of anger. When you kind of bump that person who's withdrawn, oh, sorry, and then bam! How could you bump me? You have an unforgiving heart. You are this, you are this wicked servant. What about biting sarcasm? You have this way of just taking your words and referring to somebody and demeaning them. And you're like, they deserve it. And when you think that, you're disobeying this passage. You are not forgiving. You are the wicked servant. When you have condescending communication, thinking yourself better than another, you have this bitterness. When you're over, overly critical of others. When you are continually suspicious and distrustful, you're not forgiving. You're not, you've forgotten your promise not to remember. You are the wicked servant. When you are intolerant, hypersensitive, when you're impatient, when you're disrespectful, Sometimes when you're rebellious to authority, it's because you're not able to forgive. Sometimes when the authority is abusive, they're not able to forgive. What about depression? Depression often comes on because of the inability to forgive. Sometimes doubts of salvation come from your inability to forgive. Remembering others' offenses against you with great specificity. I remember they were wearing the plaid shirt and it had the wrinkle right there and they had the eyebrow right there and they were standing right here and they had their finger out just like this and with a little crooked part. <laughs> and then they said to me, <laughs> and they laughed at me and I will never forget. There are events that have happened in your life that you have held on to and you have you remember with great detail. And what does it mean? It means that you are the wicked servant. Who is he saying this parable to? The disciples. Wake up and be warned. Do not be the wicked servant. If you see these signs in your life, not if, when you see these signs in your life. You must fight and fight with goodness, fight with grace. Instead of thinking that sarcastic comment, you think, no, how can I say something nice and kind? Instead you th of being withdrawing, no, then you, you say, how can I do something kind for them? So I exhort you, you must fight for forgiveness. And the only way you can do it is when you remember how much you have been forgiven. And that is the way that bitterness goes away. That is the way that bitterness goes away. This, this wicked unforgiveness. And look at the judgment that comes on in verse 34. And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. For the Christian who doesn't forgive, it is going to be extremely grieving in life. You're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. You're going to grieve your Lord. And your life will become one of grief. Psalm 66 talks about how your, your prayers will be hindered if you're not forgiving. 1 John 4.20 shows that you will have a lack of love for the Lord. In Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 6, you will see a great scourging come in your life. In 1 Corinthians 5, if you, you continue in the Lord's Supper, it may even cause you to die. But the character of one who is continually unforgiving is a very dangerous place to be. Look at Mark 11, 25 to 26.
This idea is repeated uh, many times throughout the Gospels. And just for clarity and simplicity, I'll have you look at this one. In Mark 11, 25-26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. What is the character of of one who is unforgiving, but a wicked character. The character of the Christian is one who is merciful. Blessed are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. This man, in verse 34, this wicked servant was delivered to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And so now in verse 35, the Lord takes this parable... And he applies it. The scenes are done. The story has been told. And he, refer, he turns to the disciples now. And, and he uses the vocative, the direct address, the same way that Peter addressed the Lord. Now he addresses Peter and all the other disciples, saying directly to them, So my heavenly Father also will do to you, and it's in the plural, will do to you all, if each of you all, from his heart, does not forgive his brother. This is to make you very, very afraid of not forgiving. You must be terrified of bitterness in your heart. The Lord is saying this to his disciples And now he's saying it directly to you. If you do not forgive your brother from the heart, the Father in heaven will do the same to you. If you do it from the heart, Proverbs 19.11 says, it is the glory of a man to overlook a trespass. Romans 12, 19 tells you about how you need to resist revenge. That will be from the heart. If you do it from the heart, 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 says you will not seek to do evil for evil. Spurgeon talked about how when he was very young, he learned this skill. And you can almost see a little Spurgeon in the sandbox. One kid steals his toy, and he learns to steal it back. One kid hits him, he learns to hit them back. And what he's saying is, I learned this at a very young age. When somebody hurts me, I hurt them back. But that is not the character of a Christian. It is not return evil for evil. If you have it from the heart, Luke 6, 28 says you will wish well on your enemy. If you have it from the heart, Proverbs 24, 17, you will grieve at your enemy's calamity. If you have it from the heart, Matthew 5, 44 will teach you, that you how to pray for them. If you have it from the heart, in Romans 12, 18, you'll have to be seeking reconciliation. If you have it from the heart, Exodus 23, 4, you'll be willing to help and aid even your enemies. And the way John MacArthur says, if it's from the heart, you have never been more like God. You are never more like God than when you're willing to forgive. Does that encourage you to forgive? It is the best of man to forgive. And bitterness can bring out the worst in in man. Bitterness is at your door. And it can consume you. But forgiveness, following the example of Christ, forgiveness will fill you with joy. Forgiveness from the heart, based on the gospel based on what Christ has done, then you can go out and forgive. Do you remember the story about Anita Epstein and how she cannot forgive even the entire people from Germany? Entire nation? Let me read you a story to close. 
that's someone else who suffered from the Nazis. Those who are older in the faith, I'm sure will remember this story, that it, it's uh, for, from Cory Ten Boom. Um, Cory Ten Boom wrote The Hiding Place, it was a very uh, well-read book, and she was someone in Holland who was hiding Nazis, or hiding, sorry, she was hiding <laughs> Jews from the Nazis. <laughs> She's hiding Jewish people from the Nazis, and they, so you had a, they had a secret room in their house, called, and they called it the hiding place. They are eventually caught by the Nazis, and she was sent to a prison camp with her sister Betsy, and her sister died in the prison camp. Corey Tenboom writes, It was in a church in Munich, so she's in Germany, that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown, brown felt hat, hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door of the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed to hear they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to, like him to think that it's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our, our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There are never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People st stood up in silence. In silence, they collect their wraps. In silence, they leave the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform, a visor cap with its skull and crossbones. Then it came back to me with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you, you were. Betsy had been arrested for concealing Jews in our, in our home during the Nazi occupation in Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me. His hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. It is good. It is good to know that as you say, our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had so spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled with my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among the, those thousands of women? But I remembered him. And the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravenbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, no, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? I stood there. I, whose sins had again and again needed to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for asking? Could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but it seemed hours as I wrestled the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who injured us. If you do not forgive men's trespass, their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will the Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a command of God, as a, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were not, 
were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And I, I stood there in the, in the, with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. The will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can't lift my hand. I can't. I can't. She said, no, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. Lord, you supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bring tears to my eyes. And she says, I forgive you, brother. And I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. How is it possible that Anita Epstein, who had never seen a Nazi guard, could never forgive? But Corey Tenboom, who had seen many Nazi guards and seen her sister die in the hands of them, can forgive. Because Cory Ten Boom understood how much she had sinned against God and how much he had forgiven her. Remember the forgiveness of the Lord and bitterness will be far from you. Remember the character of the Lord, His compassion, and compassion will be in you. Remember the Lord and you will go out and you will be able to forgive Never forget the gospel and how much you have sinned against the Lord. And it will lead you to be like Him. Let's pray that the Lord will help us to forgive. Lord, we are a sinful people and we are so easily prideful and arrogant. So easily with a sarcastic word. So easily with bitterness. So easily withdrawn so easily with anger. Lord, help us never to forget your compassion, your payment of all sin, how you paid it all. Dear Lord, help us to live that way so that we may forgive others as you have forgiven us. Amen.